most important speaker in this whole room or in your room is right here. It's the center channel. So what you put in front of it is extremely important. It should be very important to you to maintain its awesomeness, how it sounds. You don't want to put anything in front of it that's going to hurt that. All right, guys, welcome back to Home Theater Gurus. It's been a while, but we're finally almost done with the house. But uh, the theater's coming along. It's kind of slower because we're trying to get the house done. But as you see, we've got a projector screen up. So now we're going to talk about projector screens. We're going to talk about what I've been using for the last 15 years or so, what I recommend and uh, why I recommend it and why it's also best in class and how it ranks against some of the competition. So first let's talk about why you may want an acoustic screen versus a solid screen. At some point for most of us, we're going to get to the point where we've advanced, you know, we've got our treatment panels are all up. We've got everything's where it should be except for one speaker, our center channel. Center channel is below the screen. So that's an issue. And why is that an issue? Well, a couple of reasons. First of all, it makes us use a horizontal center channel. And the problem with that is, especially with two-way horizontals, sometimes a, th a three-way they can get away with this, but with a two-way, especially because of where the crossover point is, you've got two woofers and a tweeter in the middle. So what happens is when that speaker is designed, it's designed on axis and all the drivers are time aligned. So as you move off axis, you get further from this speaker and closer to this one. I mean, you may be thinking, oh, that's just irrelevant because it's such a small amount of distance, you know, difference, but it, it does matter. At some point, you're going to get out of phase and you're going to have nulls off axis. This is why people really don't use, especially behind the screen, you're not going to see a horizontal center, especially if they know what they're doing. Because in a home theater, we do have seats where people are sitting off axis and it could happen. Those nulls could be at 25 degrees or 30 degrees off axis. So those outer seats could have problems with uh, vocals and things like that. And also you've got reflections to deal with. So those are going to, those reflections are going to be bouncing off the wall and depending on how you're treating the room. So that is one issue. Another issue, when you recline the seats, often you're blocking the center completely when it's below the screen. You know, like my screen here, I still have to adjust it once I get the seats in place, but it's probably going to come down a couple inches. But I like to have my screen right above, you know, my feet when I'm fully reclined. I don't want to waste any space and I, you know, I don't want it too high, I don't want it too low. I like it perfect. But if you've got a center channel under the screen, you have a U-shaped sound stage. You get used to that after a while and it doesn't really bother you. But just understand if you were to close your eyes and you're, I'm talking to you right now and I was to, you know, jump down to the floor while talking, you know, you could follow my voice. And if you can't follow that voice of someone, you know, 10, 12 feet from you starting here and then all of a sudden they're on the floor and you don't know it, then you might want to go to the ear doctor because you got some hearing problems. I mean, it's very, very evident. So you have a U-shaped sound stage. So that's another big issue. And when you go to a center channel behind a screen, now your mains, if you're following the proper mains, you know, placement and you want that huge sound stage, they're not going to be behind the screen, but your center channel will, and you're not going back. It is a very huge improvement. I mean, it really is. It's, once you have it, and if you got the right screen, and that's what we're fixing to talk about, you're not going to go back. It's not going to happen. It's something that you've just got to have because you don't want to lose that pretty big performance improvement that you just gained. So acoustic screens, there's two types. There's woven, and there is perforated, sometimes called a microperf. So woven is kind of how it sounds. It's a woven material that allows the sound to pass, you know, kind of like a fabric, but often it's made out of PVC or some type of a plastic. And then there's perf screens. Now a perf screen is nothing more than a solid screen. And you're like, you tell the manufacturer, hey, I want a acoustic screen. Like, oh, no problem, we'll just punch a bunch of holes in it. Now that's kind of dumbed down, but basically that's what it is. It's just a bunch of holes. It's perforated. They just put holes in it and now they call it acoustic. Now, is it really acoustic? Well, we're going to talk about that. Recently, I watched a great video by Audioholics on screens. Now, I love watching their channel. It's always science-based, data-based, just really good. And Matthew Poe, he went and did his thing and he's really good about just collecting data. So I'm going to put a link to that down in the description. Go check it out if you're in the market for a screen or if you want to get a little more in depth than we're going to get here. We're just going to hit it on the head here. So on the video of Audioholics, Gene just got a screen. I think it's a $5,000 screen, a very, very expensive screen. And it's a perf. 
It's a perforated screen. And he's having fits with it because of the attenuation, for one thing. That's just one of the problems with the perf screen is the amount of attenuation. Manufacturer spec 6 dB. Now that's important. Okay, we're gonna get into manufacturer specs and what you really get from woven and perf in just a few minutes. So 6 dB is what it spec when they measured it they got 13 db they had to boost 13 db now at 6 db if say the center channel with nothing in front of it if it took 100 watts to reach a certain level with 6 db now they're at 400 watts but now they're at 13 db well at 10 db it takes twice the power so that'd be a thousand watts where it, it used to need 100 but uh you know then there's another db on top of that but anyway what kind of tweeter because this is going to be in the upper frequencies i mean it, it'll start to attenuate you know kind of in the mid-range area but really it's going to hammer that tweeter hard not many tweeters can handle a thousand watts and not many amps are going to be able to push that cleanly so you have a major problem now would you call that an acoustic screen i mean you you'd be the judge there in my mind an acoustic screen is going to have very very little attenuation it's going to be basically acoustic you know like acoustic fabric it just lets the sound pass without harming it much at all now these are not secrets everyone or anyone that really does research you're going to find out these issues it's just manufacturers don't like to talk about it and if they've got a solid screen it's real easy for them just to perforate it and then they sell it and yes it may have a great picture they get audio through it not everyone's a super critical audio guy i am so here's a little diagram right here that just kind of shows a perf screen, what happens, and a woven screen. See the woven screen, it just allows the sound to go through. And we're gonna look at the attenuation. Now think about the attenuation means it's being blocked. It's gotta go somewhere. And this material doesn't absorb, so it's getting reflected back and just kind of scattered behind the screen. So if you look at the perf screen, that's what's happening. It's getting reflected back. A lot of energy is getting reflected back depending on the screen. Just talked about one that was 13 db of sound not being allowed to pass all right and then notice the little the two little spots where the sound is passing those are perforations so he's, they're showing a, like a microscopic view of two perforations and you see how each one is acting like a source so with a perf screen you've got just a ton of little sources and they're all interacting with each other so you've got something called diffraction grading You've got comb filtering from all the, the sound bouncing off behind the screen. So not only are you dealing with some major attenuation. Now again, I don't want to generalize. This is some perfs are going to be better than others, but you're dealing with major attenuation or much more than a woven. And we're going to get to actual measurements, third party measurements in here in just a little while. You're dealing with that. And also it's just trashing the audio in other ways, adding all these artifacts and distortion to your most important speaker in your room. All right, so now we're gonna look at a test from AccuCal where they tested a lot of projector screens that, you know, some of them very, very expensive screens and they tested them head to head to see who was best in class and different classes of screens, you know, with a low gain, high gain, acoustic. But if you look right here, the MicroPerf products will have acoustic properties similar to the AudioVision product below but offer the option of substantial screen gain. We're gonna talk about that too, which can be very beneficial. All right, so if you look down here, all right, AudioVision had a max dB loss of six. Okay, again, six is horrible. And they're coming right out and telling you if you've got a micro perf, this is about what you can expect, okay? All right, so now we're gonna talk about screen gain just really quick. The gain is how much is reflected back to you. So you have your projector, it's projecting the light to the screen, and then it's, the screen is actually gonna reflect it back. So the screen's gain is gonna control how much light you actually get or see. If you have a gain of one, whatever it gets or however much light that is, is gonna be sent back. With a perf or a woven screen, you're gonna have some light loss because it's got holes in it, you know? I mean, it's just the way it is. You may even see a little light, like if you peek behind the screen, you know, you can see a little light behind it that's getting through. It's not a solid, you know, screen that's blocking light. So they'll have a coating in the screen. Now these coatings can be issues. Sometimes you'll have hot spots if the, if the screen is too high of a gain. Sometimes you'll see sparkles. So that's something to think about, especially with a really high gain. You know that something's happening to that screen to boost it that much. That's gonna cause hot spots and other issues. You know, it might be really bright 
in the center, but as you get off axis of that screen, you know, it's not, uh, it's not gonna be as bright. You're gonna lose light output. So, you know, that's not really good either. And this test is actually gonna look at that. These results we're fixing to check out. So let's check out some high gain screens. Now this is just to show you manufacturer specs and how worthless they can be. All right, now we're not purposely picking on any brand. We just wanna pick a brand everyone's heard of. So we have the Stewart Firehawk G4. Let's look at that. Published gain of 1.1. This is in the high gain category. They're over a one. It actually came back at a 0.91, so less than a one. The G3 is 1.25, which would be, you know, that one would actually have a lot of gain. That's a pretty good bit. I mean, it's not a crazy amount, like, you know, the 2.4 at the top, but it's a pretty good gain screen. It's 0.90. It's even less than the G4. All right, and if you look at the off axis, you see the G3 is, uh, well, let's actually look at the G4. It's worse, 0.91. And then off axis gain was 0 0.70. That's a pretty big variation from your on axis to off axis, how bright the screen is. So keep those numbers in the back of your head. Those are two popular, supposedly high gain screens, but of course they're not high gain when they were actually measured. All right, so let's go ahead and check out acoustic screens, right? That's why we're here. So acoustic screens, the top three highest scoring screens are all made by Seymour, Seymour Audio Video. And the XD, that's this baby right here, it's best in class. Now it's going against, you know, other screens. Some of them cost even more. Now there's screens out now, you know, I've heard some people say, well, this screen just came out and it's not on this test. Well, yeah, but we can't go by the manufacturer's data, okay? I mean, just because a screen says it's gain is the same as a Seymour XD, it's the manufacturer talking, and here we have test results. So I would just kind of say it's irrelevant. And if it's a perf screen, personally, I'm not touching a perf for obvious reasons that we've just discussed. But, you know, I'll leave that up to you. I'm just here giving you some data. All right, so center stage XD had a max loss of 2 dB. That's it, 2 dB. You go up to your processor or your receiver and you turn it down 2 dB, you can barely even tell. Now, one thing to remember is this isn't 2 dB across the whole, you know, frequency response. It's really up in the upper end where it's cutting that 2 dB off. So that could easily be EQ'd, you know, to where it's perfectly, you know, the same response as the other speakers. I mean, very little effect on your amplification. You know, uh, it's as far as acoustic screens to give you what you get when you get the center behind the screen. This is as good as it gets. Now, there's a back a uh, black backing that you can put behind the screen. I don't have one here. And if you call Seymour up and you tell them, you know, your room, what projector you have, your seating distance, they'll help you choose the right screen. And if you need a, back, uh, yeah, a black backing, you know, they're gonna let you know that. But I've got the duck board back here. So I've got absorption all behind the screen, which you should have if you're doing an acoustic screen, no matter what kind it is. So it's all black, speakers are black. I don't need that extra 1 dB of loss that I would get if I had the, the black backing. I've had some people not even realize that you didn't have to have it, but a lot of the reason is because they sell or they use perf screens. So, you know, this one here, you don't need it unless you have like a white wall or a light colored wall back there and black wall back there, you don't have to worry about it. Let's go back in our brains for just a second. Let's look at the G3 and G4. My brain's not working too well, so I'm gonna look at my cheat sheet here. Uh, 0.90 and 0.91. These were high gain, supposedly high gain screens. Here is a woven screen that's putting a spanking on them because the center stage, you know, they did claim 1.2, the manufacturer did, but it's 0.94, which is the highest gain screen I've personally seen in an acoustic screen to date that's actually been measured. All right, and, and look at the off axis, it's 0.93. That's a 0.01 difference as you sit off axis. So there's not gonna be any difference in light output as you, you know, you move from left to right in your seating. I mean, that is just exceptional. Now this screen here is, uh, has a little bit of a weave to it. So from, you know, 11 feet back, it even says so, they have a little write up on here. And actually they say at nine feet, it's slightly visible. It would be best for 11 feet or greater viewing distance. And I agree. You know, once you're at about 12 feet, it's completely gone. It's not an issue. Now, if you are closer than that, you know, the number three on the list is the UF. Now the gain is lower 
but you can sit much closer to it. It's a very smooth screen. So still got exceptional uh, acoustic properties with a loss of two. And also the off axis, another one with 0 0.01 of a difference. The gain is 0.8, off axis is 0.79. So, but your the screen is going to be smaller because you're sitting closer. So your screen is going to be, you know, you're going to gain brightness from that reduction in screen size. And two more things about the micro perf screens, with that diffraction that you're getting, it changes as you go left and right or as you move. So you can't fix it with room correction or EQ these problems out because you may try to do your best to fix it here, but when you move over, it's completely changing because you're getting so much blockage. I mean, and it's all interacting with each other. It's just acoustic chaos. And, you, and then the second thing is, we've all got plenty of room in our theaters, right? If someone asked you, hey, let's give up a foot of room in the front of the screen, no problem, right? Well, that's what MicroPerf wants you to do. You've gotta be spaced off of those speakers a foot, sometimes more, depending on the manufacturer and what they recommend, you know, to get whatever they think you should be getting out of the screen, which, as we've seen, you're not gonna be getting anything good no matter what, but you know, so that's something to think about. But uh, a screen like this, now again, this is the XD, the Seymour XD, rated best in class by AccuCal. So this is not just a run of the mill woven screen. This is, I've had these screens up to an inch and a half from the speaker and gotten excellent sound. In this room, we're about two and a half inches away. So you, you don't have that limitation where you're forced to be so far away. So back to the episode of Audioholics on screens, they actually had a guest on there that was not just an ISF calibrator, but he's a trainer. So the guy works for ISF and trains calibrators. So if you want someone's opinion, I mean, who better than an ISF trainer? So the ISF trainer got on the subject of the video performance differences of woven versus perf screens. And he said they tested them, of course, you know, they, they, they're ISF. They tested them with drop down screens where they could put one in front of the other. And they said they couldn't really tell a difference, basically. I mean, you can go back and watch it yourself and take it for what it is. But it, as far as he was concerned, it was so minimal, there was other things to worry about. I'm not giving you my opinion at this point. This is an ISF trainer. All right, guys, so that's why I've chosen this screen, the best in class Seymour XD material. But also the frame itself, this thing is built like a beast. It's not like the cheap ones are, $600 isn't cheap, but the cheaper screens that you find like on Amazon, uh, you know, if you save up a little bit longer, you can get a much, much better, you know, product. The aluminum that this thing is constructed out of is extremely strong. And here's some pictures of how you assemble it. You basically just lay it on the floor face down. You have these corner, brackets that slide into it there's two on each corner allen heads tightened it down you unroll the screen and you use the little rubber bands here to hook loop and hook until you've worked your way around the screen then you install the z bracket or like a french cleat this one has two depending on the size of the screen it may have one but that's what supports the screen and it hooks on top of the frame hooks into the frame that aluminum framing so it's a very slick easy to assemble uh, screen wham bam you're done in 30 minutes so this has the masking panels. I highly recommend the masking panels. Now, there are some guys that want scope. And last year, I think I had about 40 clients that I designed rooms for. I had two that wanted scope. And where I say two that stayed with scope. The other ones eventually went with a 16 by nine, you know, with or without masking. Long ago, 16 by nine was pretty much scope screen with the sides cut off. It's not like that anymore. Nowadays, directors actually use aspect ratios during your viewing to change the mood of the scene. I had a client that wanted a scope screen. On my questionnaire I send out to my clients to get the ball rolling, I have a bunch of questions, and one of them is, you know, how do you use your screen? You know, if you game or anything like that, like we do, uh, watch Netflix and that kind of stuff, it's no-brainer 16 by 9. Well, this guy, he did that, but he still wanted a scope, so I asked him what series he watched. And he's like, oh, I watched The Mandalorian, he went through a list of them. And pretty much everything he watched did this, but the Mandalorian, I Googled it, and of course they use aspect ratio changes. And they talk about how on the planet, or one particular planet, they have like a scope screen. Because they want you to have like a more squished feel, like a wide open, you know, area. But when there's a battle scene, when the crap's about to hit the fan, they blow it up to a 16.9 to give you a sense of, you know, something's about to happen, something big. He never even knew it. And that's what the director is going for. They don't want you to know or really 
notice it, they want you to get the mood, they want you to get that feeling from it. And so he was getting it, he just didn't know it. Now, if he'd gone with a scope screen, he would have completely lost that. And with a scope, also 16.9 is now too small. Again, it's not like it used to be where they're just cutting off the sides, they're using it to change the mood or of the scenes. Now, if you just watch a bunch of old movies, they're all in scope, you know, then yeah, maybe you wanna do that. And a couple I did, that's the, that was the case. Of course, get what you want. That's just the way I feel about it, is that it, it limits you and it actually takes away from the director's intent. But let's say we're watching something in scope, so we want a scope screen. We know there's no aspect ratio changes, so we've got the Seymour masking panel, so let's slap these little babies on. Now these have a magnetic system, and if you look right there, I don't know if y'all can see that, but it says top right, all right? Uh, screen's a little high, but I can still reach. I don't know if y'all kind of heard that. It kind of sucks right into place. All right, top left. And I got a bunch of junk on the floor over here. All right. And this one is bottom left. And of course, bottom right. And I'll show y'all this. It actually has like little pieces right there that hook in the bottom edge. The top doesn't have anything, it just pulls right up with the magnets. And there you go, now we have a scope screen. So my recommendation is if you're thinking about going scope, you're going back and forth, do yourself a favor. Get as wide as a viewing angle as you can in 16 by nine, and I guarantee you it's gonna be great in scope. 16 by nine, no matter what aspect ratio that you have, it's gonna be nice and immersive. You're not gonna have just an immersive viewing experience with some material, you're gonna have it with all material. Now I'll tell you right now, if you try to go wide enough with a scope screen to get your mains behind it and have the mains optimally placed for that huge sound stage, scope screen's gonna be too big. Okay, you're gonna be watching it all by yourself because the rest of the family doesn't wanna watch it because it's fatiguing. And you're gonna wonder why, and you're gonna love it, but no one else is. So, uh, but anyway, that's personal preference, I guess. If you want a huge sound stage, but you want a comfortable screen that's immersive, but everyone wants to, can enjoy the room with you, you know, follow the angles. I've got videos on that. Episode one, it's an earlier video. My first ones, I kinda sucked back then, not that I'm great now. But uh, go check that out and it kind of discusses sound stage and how to get the mains perfect. And then there's another one on viewing angles for the screen and how to calculate that and get those perfect. 45 degrees is my go-to. 48 is probably my max that I really want to have a 16 by nine. If you had a scope screen, I wouldn't personally go over 50. 53, I hate, had that in my old room. 50 is kind of my line that I you know draw the line there. So if you've got a 45 to 48 degree viewing angle on your 16.9, you're pretty much as big as you want to go on scope as well. Trust me, that's how I make sure my clients are happy with the screen size and you know they're not wishing they'd gone bigger or smaller. It's perfect. So just a disclaimer, yes, Seymour is sponsoring this uh, theater with the screen here, but I've been a customer of theirs. I've sent several customers to them. So it's just a way of them saying thank you. When you buy a screen from them, even with my code, HTGurus, which saves you 10%, I make nothing, okay? I just want to let people know this is an awesome screen. I hate when people spend their money on things that they could have got something better. And that's how I feel when, you know, people are buying some of these screens that are trashing their audio. And as an audio guy, I just hate seeing that. So it's a great screen. Good luck finding something better. Use the code HTGuru to save yourself 10%. Or if you call them up, just let them know I sent you. All right, guys, that's going to be it for this one. I will see you all next time.